Hello everyone and welcome to the Adjunct Success Initiative. My name is Enwena Kai Gates and I'm the founder of this media project that's designed to provide resources for adjuncts at Community College of Philadelphia. So here we learn all about high impact teaching practices, assessment measures, learning outcomes, and all types of resources for students and adjuncts. Um, so while I'm, I'm an instructor here at CCP, I'm, in, I'm an adjunct in the English department as well as I teach at other places, but I find CCP to be a great place to teach. And today we have Myla Morris, who is a full-time English instructor, as well as the Associate Chair of Developmental English. Right? Did I get that correct? Oh, okay, yeah. yes. great. <laughs> um, so welcome. Um, and we're just going to talk about, you know, helping adjuncts today, like the resources that are available for adjuncts, specifically teaching the developmental courses here at CCP. Great. So can you just talk to us a little bit about your background and how you came to CCP? And Sure. Yeah. So I, uh, I've been teaching composition for about 14 years, actually. I um, when I finished my master's in English, I thought I wanted to teach literature, which many of us do. Yes. <laughs> right. Reasonable. And I was living in Florida, and I had a friend who was teaching at the local community college. And she said, you know, why don't you try and see if you want to teach a course hmm. at our school, just as an adjunct? Okay. And I was teaching high school English at the time. I had been for about a year, and I was also adjuncting as part of my graduate assistantship mm -hmm. at the university. Um, and I thought, oh, sure. And the first course they assigned me was mm -hmm. a developmental writing course. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and at the end of that semester, they invited me to take a one-year visiting lectureship. Wow. Yeah, so I did that at the end of that year I had applied for a full-time position which I also got. So I spent about three years teaching developmental in Florida and I'm from Philadelphia. I wanted to you know move home mm -hmm. um, and so I applied here to CCP. There were a number of full-time openings in the English department at the okay. time and I interviewed and I was hired um, and that was in 2008 so this is now I'm at 10 and a half years. Wow. Yeah, at CCP. And I've been teaching developmental the whole time. Yep. Um, and then the last two and a half years, I have been the assistant chair for developmental English. So, wow, wonderful. Yeah. So I think a lot of adjuncts teach the developmental courses here at CCP. I'm wondering, um, is it because maybe the full-timers don't want to teach those courses or I'm just curious as to why mm -hmm. that may. I don't know that that's necessarily the case. Okay. I think, um, you know, a lot of full-timers have their, their preferences or their comfort courses. Okay. Um, and I know for myself coming out of grad school, I never had any experience teaching developmental. Oh, okay. So for a lot of folks, if they've been adjuncting in other places before they come here full time, um, and they have you know assistantship experience, they really aren't mm -hmm. comfortable with developmental courses. And so when they come, they start teaching. Their comfort level is 101 and 102. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and so we tend to just have also lots and lots of sections mm -hmm. of developmental reading and writing. Um, so if you have lots of people teaching in the college writing sequence right. and then so many sections in developmental, mm -hmm. um, it just tends that the extra sections are in that area. In that area. Yeah. So obviously there's a lot of challenges in teaching developmental reading and writing classes. Um, what are some resources available for adjuncts in kind of meeting those challenges? I know I've taught 098, 099, and 108. I mean, besides the fact that there's like sometimes behavioral issues, sometimes there's a challenge of just meeting the needs of some of the students. Yeah, I think one of uh, the challenges that I noticed when I first came to CCP was that there are students kind of all over the spectrum in terms of how well they can read or how well they can write, what their strengths and weaknesses are mm -hmm. even within those domains. Um, so I think that really being able to diversify and address all of the different learners right. in the classroom can be sometimes a little daunting. Um, I think really just thinking about the course as something that's preparing students 
and not so much as there are we must all meet these certain targets mm, okay. but I'm really working with each student to try to build as many reading and writing skills with that student mm -hmm. as possible can sort of I think help calm some of the you know right. <laughs> how do yeah. I meet all calm of these the different needs yeah, definitely. Um, and really say okay with you I really want to focus on grammar with you I really want to focus on organization and hopefully with you know we've done a lot of work with keeping our class sizes as low as possible I'm sure many of us would like them to be even lower sure. so we have more time with mm -hmm. students um, but hopefully we're at a point where we can still spend some one-on-one -on -one time with mm -hmm. each of our students um, I think that's one strategy for sort of tackling the challenge and as you say there are just mm -hmm. yes yeah, sometimes there are disciplinary issues yes um, and that I think some professors aren't used to dealing with at the college level. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think the disciplinary issues really, um, you know, we have to pull up our pants mm -hmm. and be the boss in the right. classroom. <laughs> <laughs> right. In a way that I think sometimes we're just not prepared to do. But if I want the best for my students, mm -hmm. then teaching them how to behave in a college classroom ah. is a starting strategy, mm -hmm. you know, to just address it, to mm -hmm. say it's not appropriate in a college classroom mm -hmm. to call out. Right. <laughs> yes. It's not appropriate for you to walk out of the door to take a phone call because you feel like it. Right. Um, and really early on in the semester to be prepared uh, to do that mm -hmm. when it arises. I remember when I, you know, one of the first couple of years when I was here, I had a really difficult class, and I was sort of in a place where I was like, well, they're adults. I'm going to let them <laughs> <laughs> do work, work it out on their yes, own. Yes, <laughs> I'm going to let them work it out. And I realized really quickly that was the wrong approach, mm -hmm. that what I should have done is just address each issue as it arose okay. instead of saying, like, if they you know, want to use the restroom or take a phone call like right. they're grown-ups it's their time you know because it really eventually became difficult for me to teach and mm -hmm. then difficult for them to feel like I cared enough about teaching because I wasn't addressing the issues so mm -hmm. I think starting the semester knowing that it could be mm -hmm. something to handle knowing that you have a set of rules knowing that those rules are written in your syllabus mm -hmm. so that if there is an issue and it needs to be escalated right you know you have established those ground rules in writing mm -hmm. and the student can understand okay this is a written rule and yes if I can't follow the rule then I'm not following the rules mm -hmm. of the class okay so. so what would you what tips or what suggestions would you have for adjuncts so I have had experience with teaching developmental courses before I came to CCP, mm -hmm. but when I, I have, but it had been ten years out of the classroom. So when I came to CCP, I think the first class I taught was developmental, and I was just sort of like, these are some sample syllabi. If you want to use these texts, like, like if an adjunct literally has two weeks to prepare for an 099 class, like, what would you say to them? <laughs> I would say that. First of all, hopefully we have set you up with yes. a faculty mentor okay. whom you're shadowing and that we've selected that person so that they're willing to talk to you. Okay. Otherwise, the position of assistant chair for developmental or college writing or whatever unit mm -hmm. is really there as a resource. Okay. I was so happy last semester to be able to talk to two new adjunct faculty mm -hmm. who were just starting and I knew uh, it was very that it was a 10-week course. They mm -hmm. just really weren't sure what to expect. Right. And we spent about 45 minutes really talking about what to expect from mm -hmm. the class, any questions they may have had about the syllabus I was able to answer. Mm -hmm. And then I said, you know, if you have more questions, email me or come back again. Um, so I think really utilize the human resources mm -hmm. that are here. People are very, we love what we do. We believe in that we're doing it the best way we can. Right. And I think a lot of people are willing to share their advice or their experiences. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so even if I or whoever else may be an assistant chair, for whatever reason doesn't have time, there are lots of people who mm -hmm. do and who are excited to talk about their teaching. Okay. Um, 
So I would never, I would say, don't be afraid to ask for someone to talk to. Right. I, I like the idea of the faculty mentor. I don't think that was available when I was, or I just didn't know about it. Right. But I like that idea a lot. Um, <clears throat> what about the success rate of students in these courses? So I'm not asking necessarily for numbers, mm -hmm. but just some sort of like analysis of like, because I know there's a lot of different the different research that comes into play with the co-requisite model and like trying to get mm -hmm. students through these courses because it's been known that a lot of students they don't end up graduating if they're in developmental courses but mm -hmm. can you speak to the <laughs> success or the possibilities for students? Yeah, um, I think one thing I'm really excited about is the co-requisite model and yeah. what it's doing okay. um, and the increase in completion that we're seeing from okay. students going through that model. Um, and can you just tell us what that is? Because some people don't know yeah, what the prerequisite sure. model is. Sure. So right now we have only one level of developmental student is in what we call the co-requisite. And that means that they're taking a developmental writing class mm -hmm. and also taking the uh, English 101 college writing Concurrently. Writing. Yes, concurrently. Okay. But the same instructor. And the developmental oh, course is okay. being taken really as a support course. Okay. Um, in a small group setting. So mm -hmm. right now that class is capped at 13 so that the instructor can really, really focus carefully with each mm -hmm. of those students on, you know, developing <clears throat> their necessary skills and addressing their specific confusion about the work or oh, the challenges of the 101 class. Okay. Yeah, so our, our goal and it's working really well is to have students exit both developmental and level one college writing in the same exact semester. Okay. Um, and it's just, it's great for students to get the support from the faculty member teaching the English 101 class, mm -hmm. to have a really a community feel mm -hmm. in that small group English 098 class. Okay. And then the sense of accomplishment at the end of the term when they've also earned the college the credit. The college credit, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, we don't have a clear plan right now for expanding. Um, part of the challenge is that, you know, the right now the co-requisite model doesn't address reading. Oh. It is a writing only sequence. Okay, and why is that? Um, well, you know, <laughs> yeah, this is the way the model is was, you know done throughout the country. Okay. And so we're sort of taking what other schools have done. Okay. Uh, there are other schools right now that have integrated into, say, a three credit integrated reading and writing course or a four credit integrated reading and writing course. Mm -hmm. um, right now, our integration is six credits to courses that are linked with the same instructor. So okay. there's a lot for us logistically, pedagogically mm -hmm. to think about yeah. if we want to also turn a reading course into a co-requisite. I mean, okay. to think about whether that's pedagogically sound okay. um, and what that would look like for a student in terms of scheduling, for a faculty member in terms of teaching. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. So we're just- it's a lot to yeah. sort of consider for that, okay. Yeah. So as an educator, this is like a, probably a global universal question, but like, cause I'm, I'm obsessed with figuring out like why are so many students in developmental courses? Mm -hmm. But like, what is your sort of educator analysis of like, why do we have so many students who are in these courses in the first place? Well, this is a really challenging question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <It's> okay. <laughs> and I sort of have two answers. I think one, just that whatever the standard is of college ready, okay. right, is and has been consistently very high, and I think appropriately so. I'm always thinking back to uh, a series of articles that I was reading doing some research, mm. and you know, at the turn of the century, the university presidents of Harvard and mm. other places were saying, our students aren't prepared to do the writing that college demands. Wow. You know, and these are the children of, you know, wealthy business people right. and you know people with lots of connections mm -hmm. and resources and resources yeah yeah so i think the general assessment <laughs> in american higher education is that students aren't prepared to do right. the kinds of writing um so you add into that so many factors like poverty and underperforming public schools mm -hmm. and 
sometimes it's just a matter of the time from when a student last was in high school to when they're starting college. Mm -hmm. Could be 10 years since they've done any significant, you know, academic kind of reading mm -hmm. or writing. Um, and I think you find that, you know, it, writing and reading are like any other skill. You have to exercise them to keep them mm -hmm. at their top condition. Yes. Um, and so for a variety of reasons, you know, students come, they take a placement test, and mm -hmm. maybe they're just not even prepared for that. Right. You know, I think we've, we've done some talking about the, how we need really to have students when they come in to place mm -hmm. to know how important that test is. Oh. It happens in a lot of different settings, under different conditions. Um, sometimes people don't review for it, they don't know mm -hmm. what to expect on the placement test, and um, I think perhaps some preparation around that mm -hmm. would change even our placement numbers. And that's something that could probably happen during advising, I'm thinking. Well, the challenge is that not all students mm -hmm. take their placement test here on campus. Sometimes it happens oh, at, at their high, high school. school. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, not all students really imagine they're going to come here when they take the placement okay. test. And so maybe yeah, they don't. Yeah, there's a disconnect. Right. Yes. Or they come in to enroll and don't realize they need to take a placement test and so they haven't prepared for it. Mm -hmm. There are just, there are lots and lots of factors. So we're, the placement and testing uh, office and, you know, we're talking with them from the English department. I know the math and foundational math have been talking with them mm -hmm. too, just about really having students know what the mm -hmm. test means, know what the implications are, know that they mm -hmm. can and should perhaps review at home before taking it. Mm -hmm. But aside from that, I think, you know, the other factors that I mentioned, including, um, you know, what students learn in high school or don't learn, mm -hmm. or that time in between, really they're important factors in you know, what students mm -hmm. demonstrate on the placement test, right. if it's authentic, you mm -hmm. know, and they're doing their best. Is there any research that you've read or seen where, because so I teach at other places, I, particularly at Monco, I know that the, the, the departments, they standardize a lot, the, the syllabi, the textbooks. Is there any talks in the department about that? Is that something that you think might be mm -hmm. successful? Because one thing that's unique about CCP is you can teach what you want, which is, can be a great mm -hmm. thing. But for the developmental courses, I, I would think maybe. Well, I think we continue to want mm -hmm. English faculty, regardless of the course they're teaching, mm -hmm. to be able to make educated and informed decisions about what they teach their students and what materials they use okay. to teach their students. We have many part-time faculty who have been teaching here for <laughs> way Eons, longer yeah. than I've been here. <laughs> um, and I think we don't want to start telling people because you're part-time, you need to okay. use this syllabus and full-timers can do mm -hmm. whatever they want. Okay. Um, what we have done is talk a little bit about maybe offering a standard syllabus mm -hmm. for part-timers. that It would be okay. their option to, to use. use it. Yes, mm -hmm. to say, if you'd like, you can use this text mm -hmm. and this syllabus that goes with the text. Um, but I don't think we right now are interested in mandating a day by day, mm -hmm. you must use this textbook okay. kind of policy. Um, I think we have agreed that it sort of constricts the ability mm -hmm. of the instructor to be flexible. And if we said the, as we've said, the students are so diverse in the classroom that we really yeah. want to be able to adjust to meet the needs of that particular group of students. Mm -hmm. Um, and really use our own strengths to do that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So I had an experience. I taught 099 last semester, and I, it was the first time I had the experience where I felt like there were just some students that probably should not be in college, not mm. because of lack of intelligence or lack of, of any. It was just like their skill sets are should be, be elsewhere, mm -hmm. not necessarily in college. Is that something that the department talks about at all or something like, and I always wonder like, how can this be addressed? Because I would not want to see a student continuously take classes, mm -hmm. not move on, not pass. It's heart, it's heartbreaking to not pass a student in 099. Yes, yes. But for it's, the second time, it's yes. heartbreaking. And sometimes it happens for the third 
Right, yeah. right. And so sometimes I feel yeah. like, again, not because of lack of intelligence, that that student might just not be ready yes. for college. Well, I think our position is to support the student mm -hmm. in their decision to be in college okay. and not second guess their fit okay. or to even say there's a fit for you. Okay. Um, yeah, I think back to my own time as an undergrad and <laughs> I imagine <laughs> that there perhaps I remember a specific earth science class that I mm. really struggled in. And I imagine that that earth science professor could have said, I don't know what this young lady is doing. Oh, here. okay. That's <laughs> nice. Not like that comparison, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. But like she doesn't mm -hmm. get it, you know? Yeah. Um, but that never happened. Right. You know? Mm -hmm. And so I'll share with <laughs> yeah. you that I had to retake that class, okay. you know? Yeah. Um, and fortunately, no one told me to stop. So I think for a lot of students, there's, there's a lot of weight that comes with being placed in a developmental class. Yes. Um, and there's a lot of pressure to exit that class in a certain time frame that can be really difficult. And, you know, I imagine if someone has been out of school for 10 years mm -hmm. and I'm only giving them 14 weeks right. to make up 10 years of, you know. What they didn't get. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, I think part of the problem is sometimes the the academic clock mm -hmm. right is really working against students right um, and what they perhaps need is much more time or mm -hmm. you know a different kind of support so I'd be more interested in us really finding out what's motivating the student to stay what is mm -hmm. their end goal okay right so perhaps this is the you've already taken this 098 099 mm -hmm. class a few times yeah. yes you're still struggling. What is your end goal, mm -hmm. right? What are you in college to do? Mm -hmm. What do you see as the barrier between you and, you know, successfully mm -hmm. accomplishing that goal? And not frame it as these things that I want you to do in this class, but right. like being a strong reader as the end goal. Right. And what does that look like? Um, and then maybe really see if there are some resources that the student needs, mm -hmm. perhaps, you know, I mean, we're not in a position to recommend accommodations, but, right. you know, there are different things that maybe one-on-one -on -one tutoring, they need to go to the learning lab. Maybe they don't have um, a supportive home environment, mm -hmm. and we need to strategize with them about what mm -hmm. that would look like. Okay. Or maybe they don't even understand what the expectations of Or how to study. Yeah, yeah, I just noticed a lot of students just don't know how to improve their, yeah. 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 So, and I think in that conversation, it could come out that maybe the student isn't motivated to mm -hmm. be in school. They're in school for, you know, some someone other, told them yeah, to be some there other maybe. Reasons. Right. Um, but really to just find out what they want to do with this and how we can support them mm -hmm. in doing it or realizing their own ambitions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're going to be transitioning out of the associate chair for developmental English, correct? Yes. Into chair, <laughs> yes. right? Or yes. co right, okay. <laughs> so anything, like, is there any, I know there's a lot of administrative things to do in that <laughs> yes. position, yes. but is there anything that you may want to focus on as chair of the English department? <laughs> <laughs> oh, interesting. I think, you know, um, my there's a lot of my heart, of course, that is really yeah. invested in developmental education. Yes. Um, and I think, you know, when I first came into this position, mm -hmm. I was very nervous about things that were in the air having to do with, um, you know, the co-requisite model and acceleration oh, okay. and how people were going to respond to that. Mm -hmm. And I think that all of my amazing colleagues who've been teaching mm -hmm. our ALP, which is our co-requisite course, can agree that it's really great for students. So mm -hmm. I plan to continue championing, being innovative mm -hmm. about what developmental English can look like for our students mm -hmm. and how we can help them, if it's appropriate, complete their developmental courses as quickly as possible. Okay. Um, or at least simultaneously earn college credit and mm -hmm. feel like they're progressing, you know, on their path to a degree. Sure. Um, so I 
I think that's mm -hmm. certainly something that I'd like to mm -hmm. continue really working on as chair. Mm -hmm. um, and then just being a resource. I, mm -hmm. you know, I started for the faculty in our unit this year. I thought, well, let's read all the current literature, <laughs> you know. And I just I want to keep doing that. I think mm -hmm. it's important, even if we don't agree with the research, you know. Right. For us to know what other people are saying, yeah. recommending. Definitely. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's important. Um, this has been great. I think yeah. I learned a lot. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, I did, I did. Thank you <laughs> so much. Um, is there any last thoughts or anything you have to say? I feel like I've asked all my questions, but. <laughs> oh, that's good. I would just say, you know, for anyone, especially new part time, yeah. this is such a big department. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to. I think just show up and teach classes and mm -hmm. leave yeah. or feel like there's no one there to answer your questions. Mm -hmm. um, and I really would encourage anyone to just ask, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I, I know I would be, I'm, I'm here as a resource or lots of other people who are as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. I've, I have found everybody in the English department to be very, very resourceful and helpful. So definitely, definitely. Thank yeah. you so much, Myla, thank for you. doing this. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. This is the Adjuncts of Sex Initiative, and we'll be back for more guests soon. <laughs> Take care. <laughs>